So a warm welcome to everyone from the India Center and from the University of Southampton. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from everyone uh, to everyone. So we know that uh, several of you are joining from various part, parts of the world, including from uh, Asia and Africa and so on. I think so this is really absolutely, uh, we are delighted uh, to be uh, uh, hosting this uh, wonderful seminar, uh, webinar from uh, Andy. Uh, so I don't want to really get into too much uh, introduction because Andy is very well known to everyone. Uh, but we have recently started working on a on a on, on a project in India, uh, working on uh, the Norway India Partnership uh, Initiative. I think that's actually a collaboration between uh, the University of Southampton India Centre, World Pop, which is Andy's uh, 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 institution, and uh, the the Norway India Partnership Initiative. Uh, in, in Delhi, uh, which is led by uh, Dr. Ashfaq uh, uh, but and colleagues, I think, who, who's already here, uh, and also the International Institute of Population Sciences in Mumbai. We, have, we, are, we are also very pleased to be really extending these kind of collaborations to other institutions in India and overseas, uh, particularly in, uh, uh, in, 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 in different parts of South Asia. But let me just quickly, briefly uh, sort of uh, introduce Andy. Andy, Andy is one of, uh, uh, is the rose in our garden. I must say that, well, he's one of the most uh, well-respected and distinguished uh, professor of uh, 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 epidemiology and spatial demography at the university here. He's the director of uh, World Pop and Flowminder, and he's leading a very large team of oh, 50 scientists, including data scientists that also includes computer science, uh, you know, uh, web sciences and uh, population geography, demography, and, and a wide range of uh, disciplines. Uh, and his work has influenced uh, globally, like in, in terms of uh, the application, including the COVID research has been really one of the uh, uh, most uh, well-cited uh, work uh, recently. And he, his collaboration extends from various ministries, from the national governments, from the UN agencies, that also includes uh, the uh, you know, different institutions, including WHO and other agencies, uh, as well as uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, who's funding the, uh, the, the World, World Pop uh, work. Uh, they, uh, he also sort of, ha his team has collaboration with the uh, other agencies, including World, ba World Bank, the Clinton Health uh, Access Initiative, and so on. So Andy's bio is really quite wide in the sense that I think it's not just uh, World Pop and Flow Minder, which he will introduce in a minute, but in terms of his, uh, the, 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 uh, the kind of range of activities, particularly on, on vector borne disease uh, transmissions across the world, population mapping, malaria mapping, and surveillance systems and uh, high resolution gridded uh, poverty surface development and so on. So I think it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it extends more widely across a wide spectrum of, uh, of research areas. Uh, but without any kind of further ado, I think I would like to really welcome Andy uh, uh, to this uh, webinar. And what we will do is that we would request you to uh, 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 mute your uh, microphone and stop your video uh, camera, but we will have an opportunity for Q and A. At that time, we would we would be very happy if you could really switch on your camera and uh, and ask questions. So we we want this event to be more interactive and engaging, and and also I think we would be happy to really share further information about World Pop and so on. But I I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Andy. Andy, uh, again, the floor is yours. Uh, a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and um, thank you all for joining from around the world. Yeah. Good afternoon, morning, evening, um, as Savu said. So if I share my screen, then hopefully this is working. Um, yeah, we can see that, Andy. That's all fine. Okay, that's working well. Okay. So if I just move this out of the way. So yes, I'm going to give an overview of the work we do across the World Pop Group. Um, we're, a, uh, we're a group at the University of Southampton in the, the School of Geography and Environmental Science. Um, yeah, there's about there's over 30 of us in the group. Um, and in this talk, I'll really give a bit of a background and overview really as to what we do. So not going into any great depth on anything, but I'm happy to 
answer questions and I've got lots of references in here for those who want to find more information. So uh, if I start off, get this working. Um, yeah, 2020 was not most of us. Um, we may have had to adapt to things and uh, with a lot of setbacks, um, but I shouldn't um, lose sight of the fact that over the past 100, 120, 150 years, we've seen a huge progress. So each one of these dots is a country. Um, we see the income per person on one axis and the life expectancy on the other axis and all countries in the world. Though there's, there's fluctuations, uh, everybody's moving up towards that top right. And 2020 will be a bit of a, a blow to that progress, but I think the general trends will continue. So that's measuring things on a national scale. But when we start to look at subnational scales, um, we see some differences. So this is a set of countries mapped against under five child mortality rate. And we see the, the worst region in the country in blue and the best region in red. And we can see great variations in, in many countries. And if we just pick out, for instance, Nigeria here, its best performing region actually lines up with countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, who are making uh, great progress in terms of now moving towards being classed as, as middle income settings. Um, whereas the worst performing regions are some of the, the, the worst in the world in terms of being left behind. And so there's these great variations exist. Um, and if we try and map this out with existing available data, maybe we get a picture in terms of female literacy of about half the country, uh, the women are literate. But if we start to break that down subnationally, we start to see that actually in the south here, we have areas that are over 80% um, where female literacy is, is pretty high, but in the north, much lower. But these are huge regions with tens of millions of people in each region. And there's still great variation that we're missing. And what ideally we'd like to get towards is something like this, where we can pick out those variations. We can see within the high performing region, there are areas that are pretty low and are being left behind. And in the low performing areas, there are areas that are doing well. So if we can get those uh, health and development indicators mapped at small area levels, we can firstly highlight that variation we can start to perhaps understand some of the determinants of why we're seeing these variations. We can use that data operationally to target interventions geographically to inform decentralization to get local uh, participation. And we can also monitor changes. We can uh, examine success of interventions um, at local scales and we can map progress towards development goals. So that's great but we do face challenges across the world in terms of the data that uh, underlies this and enables us to, to try and do this. Um, demographic and health data can be of course resolution, as we've seen for that Nigeria example. It can be outdated. If we're relying on something like census data, that's once every 10 years. Um, and so things can quickly become outdated. The data can be incomplete. Um, there can be challenges in collecting data in certain areas of a country and there can be inaccuracies. There can be certain population groups left behind or missed um, from, uh, uh, from analyses. Um, so uh, if we're thinking about census data, we're also looking at here the year of the last census. In some countries in the world, it's been over 20 years, in some cases 30, 40, 50 years since the last census. So we're really gonna struggle um, if we are uh, trying to use these kinds of data to measure progress, map development indicators at small scales. Um, and it's not just the age of the data. There are, as I've said, missing populations, inaccuracies. And even when a country is doing a census every 10 years, there are huge changes that can occur in that 10 year period in between. Um, those can hopefully, in, in many countries, be filled in with good administrative data, registry data, but often in low and middle income countries are faced with very weak or incomplete registers. Um, and if we're thinking about a country like India, um, again, a, a, a fantastic data set from the 2011 census, um, moving towards a digital census in 2021 that will certainly speed up the process of getting data uh, out there, being able to integrate it with other sources. But we're in, the, we're in that intermediate gap at the moment. 
uh, where it's been nine years since the last census and a lot of change. So what can we do? Uh, well, there are data sets that we can start to make use of. So nowadays in household surveys, when those are undertaken, which are again undertaken much more regularly than a, than a full national census, um, GPS is, is taken. So just like we all have location information on our phones, uh, the, the maps like this can be produced of where uh, survey questions were asked in communities. That gives us a picture of some of that subnational variation, but it's pretty incomplete. Other data sources we have. So when I was doing my PhD, this was the kind of satellite imagery we were working with. We could just about tell where the sea and the land were, but over the years, things have substantially improved so that we can now see uh, buildings, we can see cows, individual people, um, all from space and all a much more regular uh, measurement. And we can, uh, computers, algorithms have improved in terms of being able to extract information from those satellite images. So this is a rural area of Afghanistan. Um, with our eyes, we can pick out where the residential structures are, but to do this across an entire country uh, would take us months. And by the time we'd finished, uh, there'd be urban growth that occurred and we'd have to start all over again. But nowadays, we have sophisticated algorithms that can we can train to recognize these types of buildings and in a, in a fraction of a second, pick out those uh, buildings pretty accurately. Um, so we have data sets like this, where a map of every building in America was recently made available. Um, the Gates Foundation has co-funded production of building footprints across the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa that we make use of now. And it's not just images of the earth in the daytime. We have images of the earth taken at night that can reveal things about electrification, um, about fires being lit, about the presence of people. Uh, we have in, uh, metrics of amount of vegetation and productivity. Um, we have in, uh, indicators of topography, of land cover and land use. And of course, again, we have this mapping of human settlements that is valuable for uh, identifying and mapping populations at regular timescales. We also have forms of data that come from uh, the mobile devices that most of us now have. Um, back 30 years ago, you probably would have looked like this with a mobile phone. Um, but today, this phone ownership has surged, particularly in low and middle income countries. So this graph ends at 2014 and those lines have pretty much continued onwards um, with phone ownership uh, increasing in many places. Still, not everybody has a phone and still it's biased towards richer countries, richer populations, certain areas, um, but it's becoming a more valuable data set. And what, it, what we can get from it are things like this. If I was to make uh, a call or send a text at 948, that would be routed through the nearest tower um, and recorded anonymously for billing purposes by the mobile operator. Then if I moved to a new location uh, and made or received a communication at 1048, again, recorded anonymously. So information that I'm dropping these kind of digital breadcrumbs that gives indications of how my movement has taken place. And when you aggregate these and anonymize them and across millions of people in the customer databases, these are the kind of information you can get. It makes beautiful artwork. This is the movement of millions of people across three months in Bangladesh, just mapping out the, the highest movement routes. Um, but it's also useful data, as I'll show later on. And it's not just working with mobile network operators. Smartphone and tech companies now are, uh, are making use of these kinds of data. So whenever we're looking at Google Maps and we see a road turn red, that's caused by smartphone location information and the smartphones being seen to slow down. So again, it's aggregate data. Um, we got some data from some volunteers in Southampton and we're able to show that it's a pretty accurate source of data and that these types of uh, 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 smartphone apps and location history measures are producing. And at an aggregate, again, aggregate anonymized scale, these kinds of data sets have been aggregated to look at broad patterns of human movement across the globe. We are zooming in on Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and seeing the richness of data that exists on movements that we've never really had uh, available to us before. So what we do in WorldPOP is try and build this kind of data sandwich. 
doesn't really look like this. It looks more like this. And we're aggregating together data from traditional data sets, some census, some surveys, and matched to the correct administrative boundaries. Um, the GPS cluster location of surveys. Um, data that comes from uh, mapping of health facilities, road networks, any kind of points of interest. Um, satellite imagery and extraction of buildings and settlements from that imagery. And then mobility data coming from a range of different sources where possible. And what we do to try and harmonize these data is put them into a, a gridded format. That gives us a consistent, comparable format integrating different types. So we're taking the world, uh, dividing it up into 100 by 100 meter grid squares and trying to estimate values for each one of these uh, data sandwich layers in, in those grid squares. That gives us flexibility to summarize to um, any administrative unit that uh, decisions are often made at. But it gives us that flexibility to integrate with other data sets. So if we have a grid of estimates of women of childbearing age, we can overlay locations of uh, emergency obstetric and neonatal care facilities, and then summarize that data to look at um, how many women are within 50 kilometers uh, of one of these facilities, and how does that summarize by the administrative units that decisions are often made at to highlight where there are gaps in the service. So that's great. How can we actually make use of this set of data? So firstly, uh, the basics of where are people. Um, uh, the kind of data that is often readily available are population counts at, say, a district level um, or some other administrative level. That gives us a broad picture of population distributions. It doesn't tell us really precisely where within these large units that can often be 100 kilometers wide, where are those populations? But what we do have is much more detailed information to tell us, okay, there's, these are where the, the building footprints are or the settlements are from, from satellite maps. Um, these are the types of land cover that exist across these units um, where that relates to how population densities change. Um, here's the satellite images of the Earth at night that again tell us how population density changes and indications of, of things like rates of poverty. So that when we have this, uh, this broad picture of population distributions, we can build a statistical model to learn the relationships um, at the finer spatial scales, and in this case, using a machine learning approach to then disaggregate population estimates to these grid squares. And this is something that we've done across the uh, entire world um, from 2000 to 2020 using a, a database of census data and projections. Um, so that we can map out, in this case, in China from 1990 to 2010, those changing population distributions, huge changes as, as people have moved to urban areas. Um, and including population distributions here in the detail we can see for India. It also includes uh, demographics. This is our the portal where we've assembled a lot of um, age and sex structure data and filled in gaps um, using uh, modeling approaches um, so that we can break down those population estimates by age and sex. And once we've broken them down by age and sex, we can also bring in other forms of subnational data. So um, from surveys, we can get information on age specific fertility rates in the bottom left there, that orange map. Um, that enables us to adjust our, our data sets on women of childbearing age to estimate things like births and pregnancies. Again, there's uncertainties in these estimates, but they're giving us a subnational picture um, and a, a flexible data set to be able to use and integrate with others. So again, these are the data sets that are freely available on our, our website on births and pregnancies. And a, an example here of those that exist at the moment for births and pregnancies in India, but something that we're, we're hoping we can improve through more detailed and updated data as, as the collaboration that Sabu mentioned at the start. So um, that's great, gives us a way of estimating populations, but there is a, a basic data problem, as I mentioned at the start. Um, if we are taking population census data um, and disaggregating it, if that data comes from 1984 or 1975 and it is just a simple projection, it's very uncertain data. Um, and even in the case of having good census data, um, it can have uh, some substantial problems. 
So what I've shown so far is this top-down approach where we're taking census population counts or projections uh, and disaggregating them to a, to a grid square. An alternative approach that we've been working on a lot over the past uh, five years is this bottom-up approach where we are working with field teams to go and collect much more recent and reliable and accurate microcensus data. So teams are going out and enumerating people in small areas or we're making use of data that's been collected anyway as part of household surveys. And then we're using our geospatial data sets to predict into those unsampled areas. So an example where this is done is Afghanistan. Um, the last census is in 1979. Um, current estimates that the government are using are largely based on projections, um, just straight line 2% growth rate. So unsurprisingly, there are substantial uncertainties in the national and subnational estimates, particularly given all that's gone on in the country since 1979. Over about a third of the country is covered by a rolling census where the government does control, uh, have control, um, but as insecurity preventing additional collection and no chance at the moment of a, of a national census. <clears throat> so this is what exists in terms of recent data. Um, and we are able to work with the government to collect additional data in those uh, small speckled areas you see. Uh, but what we do have across the entire country is our set of geospatial data sets, our data sandwich, uh, including the mapping of all uh, residential compounds. So what we can do is look at the relationships of where we do have population density data. How does that relate to each of these layers in the stack? We can look at the relationship of population density to compound density. There is a relationship, um, it's an uncertain one, but it exists. Uh, we can look at the relationship with vegetation index. Again, a messy relationship, but it exists. We can look at the relationship with settlement fragmentation, so how broken up is the settlement. And across all of those different layers, these, these kind of weak relationships start to build towards a much stronger model to then get to utilize it to predict into unsampled areas and, and complete that map. Um, importantly, it's a prediction, so it comes with uncertainty, particularly in those areas where we're predicting a long way from having any, any ground data. So it's a, an important component of these estimates. But it gives us a way to then produce estimates in the absence of a national census. So that uh, gives us a way to get to those population numbers. Um, how do we then get to those uh, development goal metrics, things like poverty, literacy, sanitation? Um, so, uh, yeah, a quick quiz here. This is uh, an image of Sao Paulo. You, when you can identify the rich area and the poor area. So that may be something that's quite easy to do, but actually how rich is the rich area and how poor is the poor area and be able to put numbers on that and measure the change is what we really need to do if we're going to monitor progress towards, um, for instance, sustainable development goals. Um, so this is where, again, the household surveys come in. So this is Dakar in Bangladesh. Uh, and survey teams will uh, try and go to representative areas of the city to ask questions about income, consumption, uh, assets, to try and get metrics of uh, rates of poverty. And do this across the, the country. So this gives us small bits of data across an entire country, uh, but a lot of gaps. Um, but again, just as we did with Afghanistan, we can look at the relationships with data sets that we do have. So there's a lot of uh, evidence in the literature and evidence from the analysis here that the rate of poverty is much higher in those areas that are a long way from roads and a long way from urban areas. We also see in the literature relationships with uh, indicators that we can get from mobile phones. So radius of gyration is the amount of movement we can measure in a population. And in this case, those who are richer or spending more on their phones tend to move a, a, a lot more than those in the poor area. Um, if we look at a measure of diversity here, this is about the number of contacts you have. So how many people do you call? It tends to be the people in the richer socioeconomic percentiles call more people. Again, it's a messy relationship and an uncertain one. When we start to bring things together uh, using data sets from the stack, we can get, build a stronger and stronger model. So here we have distance to roads that we can map out, uh, the brightness of lights at night, and that, the vegetation index, but also we can get information from the mobile phone data, the population levels. So this is 
for each region, the percentage of calls made at night time when poverty when uh, costs for calling tend to be lower. Uh, this is the amount people spend on uh, topping up credit each week. And this is the amount people move generally in each one of these areas. And when we bring those all together in a similar uh, geostatistical model uh, as before, we can then predict into those unsampled areas and do so uh, at fine city level scales. Uh, and this works pretty well. It's, it's not perfect. We're predicting about 77% of the variation in the, the survey data. Um, so importantly, we need to also map out the fact that the, we, these are uncertain relationships. So in some areas of the country, like the, the far east there, uh, our estimates are, are pretty poor uh, and, and uncertain. So it does give us a way to get to those detailed uh, maps of poverty. And these kind of approaches can be used for other types of indicators. So this is a cluster level data um, on mapping uh, vaccination coverage for measles uh, in Nigeria. And we can utilize similar approaches to produce estimates. Um, we can then link those uh, vaccination estimates with the number of under five children in an area to come up with numbers that are actually the, uh, un unvaccinated rather than proportions. Um, in East Africa, this has worked with the Open Health Initiative, we can look at uh, maternal and newborn health care indicators, so the probability of skillbirth attendance, antenatal care and postnatal care um, at district levels, which is where the decisions are made up um, to highlight which areas are being left behind. And we can also integrate data with the actual uh, locations of health facilities and health care themselves. So this is looking at the number of pregnancies, um, and the travel time to the nearest hospital. So we can identify how many pregnancies are actually being left a, a, a long way from the nearest healthcare. And this emphasizes again, the importance of looking at subnational scales. We have two key international indicators, uh, a health comprehensive facility for every 500,000 population and at least 80% of pregnancies located within two hours of the nearest hospital. If we measure that at national scales, actually um, sub-Saharan Africa looks pretty good. There's only a few countries that don't meet those indicators. When we start to look at uh, admi the administrative one level, the province level, or, and then the district level, it starts to reveal that actually we're missing a lot of that variation um, that exists across countries. And many areas are being left behind if we just look at national statistics. So uh, finally, the other component here that really uh, messes things up and makes things challenging is that people move around. Um, they move around a lot, uh, seasonally, um, within cities for commuting, and often nowadays people are carrying some kind of phone with them. As we've shown before, this kind of data, these kind of uh, phones are, are leaving digital breadcrumbs which can be aggregated to give us a picture that's pretty valuable. So this here is France and we wanted to test, um, could we utilize the density of mobile phones in an area as a way of measuring the number of people. Um, so we compared the density of phones to the census data at the same time um, and built a model that translated one to the other and it worked pretty well. We could do an accurate mapping of population. Uh, the value of the phone data, of course, is that it's measured every single minute of every single day. So we can here produce maps of population densities for each day of the week <coughs> and each month of the year. So we can see here in, in France, we have people mostly in the cities uh, on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they tend to be much more out in the countryside. And then as the, as the holiday period comes along, there's movement to the coastline and out of the cities. So that's great, um, uh, but it's really the, the data poor countries where we want to try and utilize these data to, to tackle problems. And this is a health facility in northern Namibia. Uh, and typically, <clears throat> pinned to the wall is something that tells, uh, tells them what's our catchment population. In this case, it's 1,928 people. But that's produced from the 2011 census as a simple projection forward and doesn't count for any kind of seasonal variation. Um, and that matters because if at this health facility we have 100 cases of malaria, um, and our catchment population is 100,000, it's not so much of a big problem. 
but if our catchment population is actually 100, then that's a, that's a major outbreak. So what we can do is again, make use of the mobile data, link it with census data to validate and produce a model um, to produce estimates of how those population densities are changing month by month. And we see substantial variations across the country. <clears throat> and we can then translate that into estimates for each health facility catchment area to look at what is the likely changing demand on, uh, on resources on health facilities month by month across the country. Also, we can use these kinds of data for uh, looking at uh, humanitarian situations, looking at disaster response. And this is where a lot of work and collaborations with the organization Flowminder, <coughs> where we uh, work with mobile network companies to analyze these data. And this was the 2015 Nepal earthquake. Uh, a lot of chaos in the aftermath of an earthquake and a lot of need to try and direct resources to those people who are being displaced, who are often the ones who need a lot of help. Um, and by looking at mobile data before the earthquake and then afterwards, we're able to map out where the above normal population flows from, from Kathmandu were taking place and therefore uh, deliver these to, to aid agencies to, to uh, produce uh, and guide the response efforts. And of course, it's uh, now a modern day challenge that we're facing is COVID. Um, this is the movements out of in and out of Wuhan um, in January this year uh, from mobile data again. And we see the yellow dots of people moving out, green dots, people moving in, and huge movements around because of the run up to Chinese New Year. Um, and that, of course, was unfortunately spreading coronavirus uh, across the country and then eventually to countries outside of China. What we see here in the top right, you see the date. The 23rd of January was when the national lockdown was put in place and Wuhan was sealed off. And suddenly those movements drop to, to almost zero. Um, and these kinds of data um, ourselves and many other groups have made use of to try and understand what are the most effective interventions to understand how the disease might spread. So this is using air traffic data, it's using smartphone data, and it's collaborating with companies like Google and Vodafone to estimate movement patterns uh, day by day and week by week to help inform interventions. Uh, and those kind of interventions that we looked at testing were those that we're quite familiar with, all of us, I think, um, travel restrictions, um, the early detection and isolation of cases, and contact reduction making sure mixing does not happen. Um, and we can build a model to try and uh, look at this geographically. So uh, in this case, the orange people may be infected in one patch, and that could be a city or a, a district, and uh, there can be movement from, uh, from the, these orange people, infected people, to a new patch and start the spread of the virus. And that movement can be measured through these uh, mobile data. And in this case, we looked at China, looking at each one of these administrative units as the, the patches. And of course, what we can do is look at simulations here. Once we've built a model of this, we can look at what happens if we stop all travel between regions, what happens if we detect cases early and remove infected people from that patch, uh, what happens if we stop people mixing in that patch. And uh, this paper that came out in Nature a few months ago uh, the results showed that actually in China, if there was none of these non-pharmaceutical interventions, cases would have been about 67 times higher uh, than they were at the end of February. Um, and the, the key interventions were really this, this early case detection and isolation. And also the timing of them was valuable. So the dotted line is when the interventions were actually put in place. But if they were put in place a week earlier or two weeks earlier, we could have reduced those numbers of cases by a huge percentage. But equally, if they're put in place too late, those numbers increase massively as well. It also enabled us to look at coordination strategies. So between regions in a country or between countries, um, what happens if everybody does their interventions at the, at the same time and the same kinds of interventions? Or what happens if one country or one area does something different? Uh, and really, a second epidemic is much more likely to occur, um, in this case, focused on Europe, for all countries. Um, if one country does not uh, play ball, does not implement effective interventions. Um, 
So here's an example here. If all the countries coordinate and synchronize, we actually can reduce and eliminate 90% of cases. Um, whereas if there's uncoordination, we actually see only about five cases, 5% 5 of cases eliminated. Uh, here's the, the graph showing those, those simulations. And that's because of this connectivity, because of these movement uh, are the way that this region is connected. So I'll just finish off here. Um, so a lot of what I've shown are things that were produced in our group and academics producing papers. Um, and do they actually find real world use? Well, uh, some do, not all of them. Um, but some of these gridded data sets are now routinely used for assessing uh, population exposure analysis. So uh, by UNISAT and UNITAR, these data sets are the, the default for estimating how many people are likely to be affected as a hurricane comes in or as an earthquake occurs. Uh, it gives us much, much more refined data uh, than administrative unit counts. The population data sets were also used as the basis of many of the most influential epidemic models that was presented by Mr. Trump here, um, used as the justification for lockdown in the UK in March. Um, they were also used as the basis for um, malaria statistics by WHO, so mapping the prevalence of malaria, but then also overlaying with the number of children under five um, to estimate those absolute number of cases. And the data sets have been widely used by UNFPA in their assessments of uh, the need for uh, the state of the world's midwifery. So looking at how many pregnancies there are in an area and therefore the demand for midwifery resources. Um, they've been used in East Africa to identify, as I mentioned, the, those areas that are having poor coverage in terms of uh, skill birth attendance, for instance. Um, it, with response agencies, these mobile data sets are increasingly being used to try and understand how people are being displaced in a disaster situation. <clears throat> and then planning for the elimination of diseases. Um, the connectivity between countries becomes pretty important and between regions uh, if you're going to uh, stop importation and, uh, and effectively uh, reduce case numbers. So we have examples here from Zanzibar and Haiti who have used these data sets to, to map out the coordination. And we have examples here from Namibia where mapping of the, the prevalence of malaria in, and those connectivity through movement uh, was used to identify and prioritize the distribution of bed nets to those people who are most important to the transmission cycle um, to have a, a, a bigger effect than just blanket coverage. Uh, and the population estimates in the absence of census data um, have been used. This is a presentation to President Ghani I did in, in Kabul. Um, and those are now used within government to, to plan for surveys, to deliver vaccines and, and a replacement in many cases for the 1979 basis based data. <clears throat> Similarly, in northern Nigeria, these data are used in their national vaccination tracking system um, as part of this uh, grid three program um, where we uh, support multiple governments across the world in, in producing gridded population estimates. Um, and these data sets <coughs> uh, can be explored on our website, but also are fed into uh, the construction of micro plans where teams are going out and delivering vaccine to populations. An example of how valuable this has been in Nigeria, <coughs> this is a post campaign coverage survey after vaccination uh, were undertaken using these gridded data sets in the north. Um, we only actually saw one area where uh, children were settlement and children were missed. But uh, using the, uh, uh, the, the gridded model data, whereas in the south, the old 2006 census data was used and many uh, populations were actually missed because of that. Um, and then finally, through the, the GRID3 program, we've been supporting multiple countries to utilize these gridded data sets for their COVID response. Uh, so Sierra Leone, uh, Zambia, identifying areas of high building density and high population density that may need different types of interventions where, where social distancing is a challenge. So just to finish off, um, this, hopefully I've shown these national and regional summary data can hide significant inequalities um, and the spatially detailed data are pretty valuable for reaching those that are left behind. Um, as traditional data sources from census and surveys are gonna remain vital. We still need those. We shouldn't be thinking of replacing them, um, but they can be outdated, incomplete and unreliable uh, in many settings. And these new data sources 
can help complement the traditional data sources. They can add more detailed, more timely data, um, but they're all uh, uncertain and all surrogates for, for some kind of metric of uh, human presence or movement or characteristics. So it's important to measure uncertainty in the way that they're being used. And also vital is engaging with end users right from the start to ensure that there's understanding, ownership um, for sustainable uptake and use. So I just finished um, the, to give a bit more background as to where we're coming from on this. We're the World Pop Group, um, uh, as I said, 30 staff uh, we're focused on population counts, characteristics um, and mobility. And <clears throat> for those of you who are interested in, in obtaining some of these data sets and understanding more, as our, our website is there. Um, and there are currently, I think, 44,674 different geospatial data sets uh, from multiple countries around the world that can be freely downloaded. So I will finish there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Outstanding work, I think, not just in terms of the quality, but also in terms of the impact that that your work has generated globally. I mean, from I mean, you know, of course, the presidents and prime ministers. I mean, they they find this information very useful. But in terms of really getting making the best use of this data is going to be very very fundamental. And 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 and, and, and therefore, I think this can be timely. And I also sort of uh, observe that. Uh, uh, you know, if at all, uh, the, you know, so this is act next year is going to be the, probably the last ever census that will be conducted in the British history. So, you know, well, we may not have a future census. And if that's the case, then I think your work is probably going to be one of the kind of, uh, you know, value added to, uh, you know, in terms of really replacing census with these kind of data. Also, I believe that, you know, now we have also colleagues from a uh, a few government agencies, of course, uh, Dr. Ashfaq Button team from the, uh, you know, representing the Minipi is here, but also I think in terms of the sustainable development goals, and I do believe that COVID has actually, uh, you know, come as a barrier in terms of uh, achieving some of these sustainable development goals, but perhaps I think, you know, these kind of data could potentially accelerate, you know, different allocation of resources and also even uh, help some of these countries achieve uh, those goals. So once again, you know, hearty congratulations and outstanding work. Uh, this has been really inspiring. Uh, I mean, and, and also, you know, there's, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's uh, the way that you've summarized it in, in, in a very short period of time is amazing. Now, without any further thing, I mean, let's open the floor for questions. And I'm sure that will there are uh, questions from the audience and uh, uh, please do feel free to really. So we had a, at one point, I think we have colleagues from the UNSCAP, uh, from the Economic uh, uh, and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. Uh, uh, questions in the chat there, Sabu. Um, all right, okay. So they have really sort of, all and right. And Shree okay. wants to ask a question as well. Okay, uh, that's that's brilliant. So let's, uh, let's start with uh, uh, Professor Shree. Good morning. Sabu and good morning, Andy. Thank you for a really stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, and we all uh, owe a big thank you to you and your team for the incredible amount of work you've done. Whilst I'm applauding you, I, I hope this is a slightly darker question, given what, for instance, what has been happening, if you like, in terms of using intelligence or abusing intelligence, as the cases have been, uh, and if you like, and I don't want to sound political, the recent events in Iraq, Iran, and certain countries seem to almost monopolize you know, information, intelligence. And I don't want to prolong this because I'm sure others have to ask, but it really worries me. It's almost like going back when nuclear science was you know, a big thing, it came out. It goes into the wrong hands and you know North Korea is a classic example and it's not being political it's just a fact so I just wonder whether you have thought about this is there anything we can do like a health warning so feel free to please share because that bothers me when I see all those things you're giving me details I'm going oh my god if it's in the wrong place whilst you're doing some fantastic stuff for health and education oh my goodness me I'm thinking hang on so sorry if I <laughs> no put a slight it, darker side to it, Andy. <laughs> no, I agree completely. There, there are there are certainly dark sides to particularly the the mobile mobile data use. There are, I mean, yes, I think there are 
uses of these kinds of data, particularly where the, the government owns a mobile operator and has the free use of, of these kinds of data. Um, I think, um, I mean, firstly, everything that we do, we're working with aggregate data that's anonymized. So there's, uh, it's essentially like kind of traffic statistics that anyone has access to. Um, and there is no way to identify individuals. Um, but importantly, I think it's, uh, it's showing, showing these kinds of uh, potential of these data is starting to, to uh, open up um, the, uh, the value, uh, making the case for the value of these data at aggregate levels. Um, and these don't have to be sensitive data. They don't have to be the, the kind of dark big brother tracking individuals. It's, it's only really tracking populations moving from one location to another, thousands of people going from one location to another. Um, so it becomes less sensitive um, and also showing these kinds of examples. There are many others like what I've presented uh, that are being used for, for good purposes for allocating um, disaster response um, funds for, for um, producing better estimates of uh, populations impacted by infectious disease. For, so yeah, I think we need to uh, show, the, show the good uses, but also be very careful and do good present good practices in terms of uh, the use of these data. And there are now, I think uh, I've shown a lot of the smartphone type data. There are now examples from Facebook who are making available aggregate data like I've shown to any academic, any nonprofit um, who signs up. Um, so there are examples now of these kinds of data being opened up, the, the sensitivities have been taken away. Um, and I think that's seeing an increasing use for good and it's seeing um, people being less sensitive about them. But there, I agree, there are still challenges of these kinds of data, particularly when they're used for purpose. And, and in some cases, we don't know how they're being used. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Andy, there is a question from Professor Dankmar Boding, our, our you know, Director of Statistical Sciences Research Institute. Uh, one question, how did you get access to all these data sets worldwide? <laughs> you know, what's the secret? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so most, most of these data are publicly available. The, a lot of the satellite layers I showed are publicly available. Um, a lot of the population data sets that we use as inputs, they're publicly available and we are uh, taking that publicly available data and disaggregating it using the satellite data. So mm -hmm. most things are freely available. It's just they've never, <laughs> it, it takes skills to take a, an image of the earth at night and be able to know how to process it and treat that data appropriately and then link it with uh, population data. So the challenge is often, yeah, bringing those together and integrating them. Um, but often those data sets are available. And as I said, some of the mobility data sets are now also becoming uh, available to academics, to nonprofits. Um, so uh, although some of the mobile data sets, we have to form a, a partnership with the operator, uh, in, in most cases, those are becoming available too. Yeah. We have a question uh, from Dr. Ashish uh, Srivastava, who's asking, how can we get trained on WorldPOP? <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of the broader capacity building agenda, and which you have already doing, you know, I think with uh, many, many countries, but so what, I mean, how, so probably the procedure. Yeah, so there's different, there's different ways. And firstly, there are various things on our website in terms of um, small introductions, uh, code to make use of, uh, make use of the models I presented. Um, but also we have in the past run uh, workshops. We're trying to do more uh, webinars. And then the, the grid three program I mentioned, part of the, the focus there is on capacity strengthening. So engaging with governments, engaging with local universities um, in particular to train, almost like train the trainers to, to make sure things are, are more sustainable uh, uh, in terms of trying to get these methods out there. But yeah, it's something we haven't in the past, haven't put a We've been very much focused on developing the methods first, but now this is certainly very interested in doing more capacity strengthening. We don't want to be the ones always doing this, and it would be fantastic if we could hand over these methods and, and see that's them something develop. absolutely Andy. I think that's something that we've seen that uh, magnanimity and uh, you know that uh, that that 
I think that kind of generosity, I think from your group, I think has always been for whether it is a PhD student, whether it is really any research group, I think uh, the word pop extending that support uh, has been incredible so far. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Edelson Aruda, uh, who's asking, have your cell phone data been connected with transportation models, for instance, to estimate people using cars, buses, bikes, and so on at the same time? Um, yes, I mean, firstly, I guess it's not, it's not our cell phone data, but the, yeah, it's, a, it's a property, often the property of the operator. And often the, the operator themselves uh, um, is using those data for commercial purposes sometimes, and sometimes to support um, urban planning and to support the governments. Um, so there's been, I think, a lot of work in using these kinds of data to, for urban planning purposes, um, for commercial purposes, where that, that area of the use, I think, is quite developed. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of academic literature as well. So mm -hmm. definitely that is have been used. Uh, we've been much more focused on disease and disaster response, but yeah. yeah. Sure, and I think we have uh, a, a question of an observation from uh, our own colleague, uh, Dr. Ashfaq But uh, So Dr. Ashfaq But is the uh, director of the Norway-India Partnership Initiative based in Delhi. Uh, Ashfaqji, I think, do you have, I mean, please switch on the microphone and uh, please share your thoughts on the, also on the project uh, in Rajasthan and Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you. Thanks, Rahulji. Thanks, Andy, for a wonderful presentation, as always. And uh, we're really excited because it's uh, just to brief you a little bit. The states of Rajasthan have kind of approved all the all the use of data and data sets. That is a formal process that has happened. And what is more important here? How do we? I wish I could have used this when I was working in polio eradication. We used to map out facilities. We used to map out access and utilization of services. And and with this technology, I think we can move leaps and bounds in terms of in terms of understanding the the, the services where are needed and how do you access? What is the access point of that point? I think that is coming out wonderfully well from your presentation. And. And if we are able to map out the universe of women and women of childbearing age group, the pregnancies, and then layering out the access part, if we are able to map out the denominator, I think we can do wonders, wonders in terms of, in terms, and that is the that is the that is the beauty of your work that we have got to learn from you, in 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 our in our uh, co collaborative work and. And we are also kind of collaborating with the Institute of in, International Institute of Population Sciences, who have the the evaluated data sets as well. So I think the the the, the Norway India Partnership Initiative and the state health societies of Jammu and Kashmir, and and Rajasthan are very excited about about this 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 collaboration, and we we will go to to definitely. And thank you, thanks thanks Sabuji for your facilitation, and Andy, and Natalie, and and others for the wonderful uh, kind of the the openness with which you came out to 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 discuss and and we we think that we have much more to work in india how do you estimate the maternal mortality estimation at a, at sub national level that is going to be critical for us but we wanted to start with something small and and a low hanging fruit thank you so much thank you uh, thank you ashpakji and we have also the co a comment from uh, dr anil chandran from the university of kerala so he's again asking that well you know requesting for you know potential capacity building and training especially researchers i think that's uh, and also he has a question on how will pop will pop integrate various data sets and what's the kind of errors that that we expect in these models i mean how large are these errors <laughs> yeah that's uh, yeah, it's a great question, and it's it very much depends on on what what we're integrating and what the use is um, and the scale of that use. So, for instance, in um, in Afghanistan, where we are estimating population numbers um, at very small scales, if we're going to try and estimate, for instance, how many people are in an individual village. Those errors can be really large. Um, particularly if we're estimating something that's a long way from where we have any data. But as we aggregate up and we're estimating numbers in a, in a sub-district or a district, those errors reduce and, and it, it shows that those models actually do pretty well. Um, but yes, so it, it's, a, it's a hard one to answer, but it very much depends on what the use case is. Right, thank you. 
So we have a question from Yuning uh, Zhang. Uh, he's uh, in the field of uh, psychiatric research. And his question is that I want to harmonize my data sets with measures of mental health and environmental data, such as green space, nightlight, noise pollution, or even something that represent, represents urbanization, climate change, and, then, and model these effects of these environmental factors on individual mental health. So the question is, what do I need? And uh, how do I address, uh, I mean, you know, how do I collect the data, essentially? Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's, again, it's the field I don't know very well, but it's, it sounds quite similar to some of the, the work we do in terms of trying to uh, understand the, the drivers of poverty or um, the, the kind of we're doing at the moment, multi-level modeling to look at um, the, the children who don't receive a vaccine, um, what are their characteristics? Are they in remote rural areas? Uh, what is their typical age? What is their parents' mm -hmm. education? Things like that. So it's again, it's both taking survey data at the, the household level and the individual level, but also bringing in these geospatial data sets that can tell you something about the, the context. Uh, mm -hmm. And that widens the, that scope of types of drivers that you can look at. Um, so I think, yeah, if you're doing a, a survey or have access to survey data, then if you can have that location, you can, as long as you have that location, you can extract information from satellite images, from mm -hmm. GIS data sets that exist to give you something about the, the context. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. And, and, and any other questions? I think if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to switch on your microphone and also the video. We'd like to see you <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you know, please ask your question. So we have a, a few more minutes. I can Just see your question. Okay. Right. Uh, sorry. Is there any? Uh, see, anyone? Would, would our users be first class citizens going forwards as well? <laughs> oh, sorry. The, the, this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, our, our users be the first class citizens going forward. <laughs> yeah, and um, the R, R is the kind of uh, statistical programming language that everybody in our group, most people in our group use. Um, it's the basis of a lot of our models. So it's a very valuable thing to learn. I think it's, it's grown so much in the last 10 years in terms of what it can do um, that I would encourage yeah. people to, to learn that if possible. And Hiralal, uh, thank you, Andy. Hiralal Naik asks a question about the inconsistency in indicators. Sometimes, you know, they see variations in the same indicator from different sources of uh, data or surveys. How do World Pop, World, World Pop addresses this problem? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a real challenge. And I think that whenever we're starting a project, it's it's a focus initially on understanding those data sets and where they how they've been collected. Um, getting any information we can on the quality of those data sets. Sometimes we, we do understand, we find and, and see that, for instance, even a, a DHS survey, which has a quite strong rigor in some areas, it's flagged that there's, there were problems in data collection, or you hear about that. So it's, it's firstly understanding any problems with the data. And then it's, it's always the case that two, so, two surveys can, can come up with different answers. Um, and that can then feed into the, the statistical models in terms of then producing, if there are two locations that have very different answers, that then comes out in the model to say, actually, we're very uncertain about this area because the, the, the data that we're training on shows us that we, don't, we really don't know. Right. Thank you, Andy. So I think uh, I have a very simple question. I think uh, this question is, uh, has been really uh, bothering me for a while. I mean, especially after you've done, after I've seen those wonderful uh, research that you've carried out, I mean, and the papers that have, that have come through in Nature, Science, and some of the top leading journals. Now, if we go back, if we, if we take all of us back to February, right, for instance, you know, and, 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 you know, and if the governments, for instance, I mean, I don't mean really mean to you know, the blame any system, but if the governments have really taken that seriously and they have listened to, or they have at least noticed that, look, in, uh, this is one way that we could have really understood the pandemic a lot better and we could have controlled the, the pandemic and we could have really awarded even, uh, uh, you know, we could, we could have confined this pandemic to an epidemic or even at a, low, a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I think, right, yeah, certainly at the start, there were a lot of governments that didn't take things seriously. <laughs> um, there's uh, a lot of governments that delayed and or and didn't and a lot of governments a lot of people didn't look closely at uh, learn lessons from both past past epidemics uh, and also what china did and what countries in the early stages did and they were pretty successful in what they did and um, mm -hmm. for china to to take a, a major outbreak of a disease that nobody knew anything about and basically eliminate it pretty much and still small outbreaks um there's there was a lot to learn there that it took it was slow for many countries to actually learn those lessons i think and, right. and react slowly and we now know that this is each day or each week that you delay your interventions the, the many more deaths and cases you will see right. sabu can i just oh, oh yeah yes please please no, just uh, a compliment i mean it's just it's an observation i know we can't cry after spilled milk but isn't this what New Zealand did with, with that wonderful prime yeah. minister? Am I, am I right? Yeah. Yes, and, and often it's often it's presented as a trade-off between um, economics and yeah. and, lock, and lockdown. Yeah. But actually, there was countries that that did put down, put in place severe lockdowns early on, mm. are the ones that are now their economies are recovering and they're they're booming. Whereas those that delayed saw saw big numbers of cases, disruption, and needed a longer lockdown, which was more economically damaging. So, we yeah. Won't yeah. Fund, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, but, uh, but, uh, but I think it has been really, I think we definitely want to really go on further. Uh, but uh, thank you everyone for, for joining uh, this, this interesting discussion. And, you know, as you see that, well, you, you've heard that, well, there is a lot of work that's uh, 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 going, going, on, going forward. And also particularly on India, with the Norway-India Partnership Initiative, that's going to really set some precedence in terms of really generating high quality data for planning and so on. And, you know, so there is, there is, there's a larger scope there. And uh, on, on behalf of uh, the, the India Center and the university, I definitely I'd like to first thank uh, Andy for his, uh, for his time because you know, he's always busy. Uh, so he's, he's someone who is really on call with the uh, most <laughs> government's ministers and even Mr. Bill Gates. <laughs> so that's, that's Andy. But uh, uh, so thank you very much, Andy, for, for, uh, for, for this wonderful and intellectually stimulating and inspiring presentation. And I would like to just uh, say that we'll offer a future event, I mean, just for your uh, sort of information. Uh, so on, in January, on 13th of January, the India Center is sort of uh, organizing a, uh, a, 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 a fireside chat uh, with uh, none other than that Mira Sayal, I mean, who is actually one of the very well-known, uh, you know, uh, South Asian British uh, uh, comedian, act, actress, and producers. This is part of the Pioneers Project. This is all about the untold uh, inspirational biographies of the South Asian diaspora uh, that you know across uh, different generations in Great Britain. I'll I'll I'll, I'll stop there and uh, thank you all once again. And um, we wish you uh, you know a, a Merry Christmas if we don't see you some of you. But at the same time, also please uh, stay safe. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye.